welcome to Windows on the World. I'm with here uh, with Tony Hurst, as usual, our producer. We've got a special guest tonight. We're going to be talking to Mark Steele, who's um, technical officer, and his job was to mitigate optical radio risk, radiation risk. And we're going to be looking at the bigger picture of what the 5G rollout is actually about. But first of all, we're going to go into something that we were talking about last night, myself and Tony. We actually started talking about the shortage of lorry drivers. Now, of course, lorry drivers bring in everything we need. The whole infrastructure depends on goods being able to be coming in by road. We've talked about this and the bigger picture, of course, of what the Agenda 2030 is coming into London and the way that it's not really been rolled out properly. In fact, what we're seeing is we're seeing roads being less driver friendly. But even worse than that, we've got a shortage of lorry drivers. Uh, it says here in the sun, this is from January, that the shortage is growing at the rate of 50 a day with a further 20,000 expected to quit by the end of the year. Transport watchdogs have warned the crisis could crash the economy unless urgent action is taken to hire new recruits. The average age of a British lorry driver is 55 and there are not enough young learners coming through to replace them. So the driver shortage is limiting the haulage industry's ability to deliver high quality services and this growing problem needs to be addressed. Now, this is very interesting because this is coming from Senior Traffic Commissioner Beverly Bell. And she said this is having an adverse impact on the British economy and it shows no signs of improving. Now, this is very interesting in a way, because what we've got conversely is we have one hundred and nine million pounds worth of government funding, which is going to be putting development into the next generation of driverless and low carbon vehicles as part of the industrial strategy and the government's plan for Britain. So this is an interesting development and we're going to get into what this really means because these driverless cars and driverless lorries, they're being promoted by the Department of Transport in a massive way. If you look at any of them, they're lobbying for this rollout of driverless vehicles. So this, it says here the successful schemes for this plan for Britain and this industrial strategy are the development of a high power battery suitable for high performance vehicles, a project to address gaps in and strengthen the UK supply chain. Um, Business Energy Secretary Greg Clark said low carbon and driverless cars are the future. And as government, we are determined through the industrial strategy to build on our strengths and put the UK at the forefront of this revolution. Investment in this technology is an integral part of the government's efforts to ensure the UK auto sector remains competitive and world leading. Now, this is interesting because they're also giving a further billion pounds over a 10 year period to develop these driverless cars and to roll them out so that they are going to be part of this thing called the Advanced Propulsion Centre, which is going to get, yeah, a billion. It's going to get a billion over 10 years to save, guess what, 50 million tonnes of CO2 by 2023. Now, this is quite incredible, really, because if you compare those two things, the shortage of lorry drivers and, of course, the, this massive promotion of autonomous vehicles, then you can see what's going on. But what we've got to remember is that 5G is essential around this whole area of autonomous vehicles. Um, and it has been said that these 5G microwaves can be made safe. This was by Andrew Goldsworthy of Imperial College. Now, we're going to talk to our guest about this tonight and how it's been rolled out, the 5G and the smart city agenda, because over the past few weeks, I've been looking into what this means in the bigger picture. In other words, this thing has been rolled in with absolutely no real foresight. And this goes hand in hand with what's happening with the regeneration. For instance, we've got this high density housing everywhere. We're getting the cities are being absolutely re-engineered and people are calling me from all over the country about what's going on in their local area. And it's a uniform pattern. So what we're seeing is this whole agenda of walkable cities, autonomous vehicles and 5G rollout. So 
we're going to talk to Mark Steele and he's going to tell us a bit about his background first and how he got into looking at the bigger picture of the 5G rollout. So are you there, Mark? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here, James. Yeah. That's great. Now, we've been chatting over the past day and you've come up with some things that made me look into a bigger area of 5G. And I've been looking into the actual regulation of it, what it's about. But first of all, let's get into this idea of autonomous vehicles, because when I heard about this, my first reaction as a layperson was that I would never get into an autonomous car. A driverless car would be the last thing that I would would jump into and go on a motorway because even with my limited knowledge of computer technology it's always prone to problems and getting into a vehicle that's going to be going 80 miles an hour or 70 if you stick to the speed limit then what can possibly go wrong well we found out because elon musk's best friend promoted all this stuff uh, died in a head-on collision with an articulated lorry in a driverless car and we've also had this recent accident in America with this Uber car. And the, we were chatting over the last couple of days about what this means technologically and where it's all headed. So we're going to get into the bigger picture of this 5G rollout. But first of all, Mark, just introduce yourself and tell us how you got into this. Well, you know, for, for those that don't know me, I'm the chief technology officer at, an, at a business called Review. And we're the guys that invented a motorsports helmet with a head-up display system in it. Now, this, you know, it's 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 around the houses, but what what we'll get to, the head-up display system, the waveguide that we fitted into that helmet was to mitigate the known optical radiation hazard risk. So obviously, you know, optical radiation is a hazard. What you most certainly don't want to do is project it into people's eyesight because there's obviously there's some significant risks there. One of the things that we also uh, have done in my background, I've been in research and development for over 30 years. I've spent two years in secret nuclear research, spent a lot of time in the oil and gas industry. So I've, I've, I've held some pretty interesting positions. And what we're most certainly have to be very careful of. In all product development, there are a set of standards and regulations. You use them as a platform. So you brainstorm, you check, you risk assess, etc., etc. So when I came up with this invention of a head-up display system, I already knew that optical radiation was this significant hazard. And we had to design the innovation around uh, mitigating that particular risk. And what we came up with was a, um, a waveguide that reduced through attenuation, et cetera, uh, the optical radiation hazard. So we had this successful, very successful uh, sports helmet. The reason why we put the, the waveguide in the uh, motorsports helmet, it was probably the most testing uh, of, a, of a product because obviously high impact crashes, et cetera. And what we knew, we couldn't put a rigid part in the body of a helmet. So, you know, we went through quite a lot of uh, analysis in how we've actually achieved that. So, if, you know, if people can try and understand that the implications of regulatory bodies and standards that apply to all product development. So you'll understand my concern is obviously with some of the battlefield interrogation system and some of the uh, signal systems and information that we have at hand. We knew that optical radiation, if you look at any of the uh, military weapon sites, you'll see that they operate, uh, from a technical perspective, it's 560 nanometers in and around that waveform. And the reason for that, that's less biologically hazardous to the human is what full spectrum is. So we'd actually, we did, we produced the product, it was very successful, and then we came under this sustained attack from a major technology company. And I was pretty surprised, and obviously that I can't really go into that at the moment because there's some, there's some legal actions going on and, you know, it's, it's all pretty confidential. However, they had a competing product 
when I looked at the, uh, the technicalities of this particular product and how it was actually built, I was absolutely appalled. I was appalled at the haphazard design. I was appalled at the potential for this thing to do harm. And I bumped into a chap, uh, another scientist uh, based in the USA, uh, who had other concerns about the antenna systems attached to people's heads. Because you know that your, your mobile device, your mobile phone, it tells you in the small print not to have the transmitter next to your skin. A lot of people don't know that. And the reason for that is if you were to have the antenna next to your skin, that would offer a significant risk to you. So it was a bit surprising that this particular piece of headwear actually had an antenna in it and it was attached to your head 24-7. And unlike a mobile phone, this thing was on all the time and was designed attached to your head. And I was pretty surprised and thought, how can you do that? Because obviously in a mobile phone, it tells you in the in the, in the small print, not to have the antenna next to your head. And there was a scientist, a very eminent scientist in the USA, did some work on this. And it was appalling. I contacted him and said, well, that may be a risk, but I suggest that pouring optical radiation directly into a person's eye from an uncontrolled pulse modulated uh, device is a little bit more risky than actually having an antenna strapped to your head. And that's where the whole story came from. And I, and I just couldn't understand, because obviously there are international regulatory guidelines in regard to products, all products. They're used as a basis for industry. And when things go wrong, you know, I was in the oil and gas industry for quite a number of years. The Piper Alpha disaster, it was... They're not best, not best design, and catastrophic things can happen. So this takes us to 5G. 5G hasn't, isn't risk assessed. I think this is very important, Mark, before we go any further. I've looked at the legislation both here and in America, and of course, the International Commission on non-ionising radiation protection um, who make recommendations for the World Health Organisation. And we'll get to that a bit later on. But what people need to know is this stuff is not tested. It's not tested in a way that the public could even understand because it's not actually tested for its impact because it's called non-thermal radiation generally. Is that, is that right, Mark? Well, the, the, the difference is that the international regulatory bodies, so your ICNIRP, the other body that regulates non-ionising radiation. Yes. That's yes. pretty strange because they only look at impact, for thermal impact, to a 200-pound male. So, unfortunately, if you're under 14 stone, these regulations don't really apply to you. And also... They're a thermal value, so it's basically a cooking value. So the international regulatory bodies, the World Health Organization, Public Health England, etc., all state that as long as you're only being cooked a little bit, then these devices are safe. Now, these people obviously aren't scientists because there is a vast body of work that shows that non-thermal microwave radiation and radiation frequencies can offer significant biological damage well below thermal values. And as you should know, and all scientists should know this, scientists who can't actually take into consideration the full view of published, these are peer-reviewed published papers. A chap, I'll just mention this chap, he's, he's the, probably the leading expert in the world, and there are others. Professor... Martin L. Powell, I suggest, because I always say to people, don't you know, take my word for it. Do your own research. I implore people to do their own research. Professor Martin L. Powell, he is the expert. I mean, my expertise is in optical radiation. I mean, actually, I've got a background in materials 
but obviously you can head up display systems in the terahertz range. That's where I have gathered quite a lot of uh, ex expertise over the years. And I'd probably uh, you know, put myself down as a bit of an expert in relation to that. One of the things I want to bring to the attention of the people who are listening to this, the IEEE, I was part of a working group of IEEE to assess the head-up display systems market. And the information I brought to that particular very, very well-respected body, that working group was disbanded. So there's something extremely uh, interesting going on. But what I'm absolutely positive about, the international regulatory bodies only applying the thermal value to the risks to humans and wildlife from non from uh, non ionizing radiation is flawed. It is significantly flawed, and the reason why 270 of the world's leading scientists have written an open letter to the WHO, to the United Nations, and to the European Parliament demanding demanding that 5G that would be a moratorium and 5G not be ruled out. But it's starting to look as if people aren't listening. Because unfortunately, 5G is already here. It has been ruled out covertly and in secret. Covertly through local authorities in their attempt to, whether they call them control management systems, etc., they are not. The frequency they operate at and the equipment is most certainly fifth generation. This is not open democracy. This is not Great Britain. This is not safe. These this is a very good point, Mark. Let me just add this before we carry on, because it's quite important. Uh, in contrast to the World Health Organization, the International Agency for Research in Cancer who were affiliated to the World Health Organization, classified extremely low frequency magnetic fields, ELM and MF, as possibly carcinogenic for humans. And they stated that you should take all reasonable measures to reduce exposure to electromagnetic fields, especially to frequencies from mobile phones, and particularly the exposure of children and young people who seem to be most at risk from head tumours. Pay attention to electrosensitivity and introduce protective measures, including the creation of wave-free areas not covered by the wireless network. And the, the, the World Health Organization stated in 2011 that RF fields were possibly carcinogenic in humans. We're going to get into a, a broader picture of this, but that's very important that when people say that, oh, it's like climate change, 97% of scientists agree. Well, that's a flawed premise because they don't. And what they do is they skew this data and the public don't really know what's going on. But what I have found out, even looking at the surface of this over the past few days, we did have Barry Trower on years ago when I was at the People's Voice and we covered this in a broader area. We also to add Ingrid Dickinson on, who has the website Earth Breathing. She's been extremely concerned about this. And what we've got now is a rollout of something which is going into these autonomous vehicles, which is why we brought that up at the beginning of the show. And it's a very good example because we're talking about technology here that there is no actual legislation to cover. I've looked at how they get around it in America and here. And I think we should play that audio, Tony, very soon about this chap, Stephen Hilton, is the director of Bristol Futures Global. It's something that's on YouTube and he put it up two weeks ago. Now, bearing in mind that this is going to affect the whole population of the country, what he's talking about, smart cities and 5G, all, all the rest of it. It's had 21 views in two weeks and he's just in the back of a pub or something talking to his camera. It's not even a real video. It's not even a properly produced video. It's very, very odd that you get this. It's just like we get with the IPCC and the, and the UN. They 
they have advocates put these videos out and have these conferences that none of the public are engaged in. And this is very, very important. There is no public engagement in this whatsoever. I thought it was very important to make that point, Mark, before we carry on. So it's not just scientists. There's no public engagement. Well, there's, there's a, there was a uh, Professor Paolo Vecchi who, mm. at a conference in London. Now he was the he was the head of ICNIRP. And I'm going to quote him. What Professor Paolo Vecchi said the expo about the exposure again. What they are not, they are not mandatory prescriptions for safety. They are not the last word on the issue. And they are not defensive walls for industry or others. But that is exactly what they have become, used as a defensive wall against the very many published and growing scientific research papers showing the significant hazard posed by non-thermal microwave radiation. The current 3G, 4G and experiment of 5G transmitters have not been risk assessed against any smaller body living things like pollinators or the unborn. There are no, I mean absolutely zero, there are no long-term studies or research showing that chronic exposure to, to this type of radiation is safe. Absolutely none. The recent, I mean, obviously I've got a, you know, an issue with these, uh, this 5G because 5G was ruled out in Gateshead by Gateshead Council, not the only one across the country, there are quite a few that we're now finding out where they've rolled out new LED streetlight with these 5G, it's the precursor, it's the hardware for 5G, but it's on. It's on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Very, very good for 3D mapping people's homes. And I was actually, I brought this up with Gateshead Council. Obviously, I don't believe they, you know, I, mean, I didn't expect them to be clever, but I mean, the, the, the foolishness of these people that are spending multiples of millions of pounds on these technologies in the hope that the technology will benefit them in some time where they can spy into your home, they can tell you whether you want a pizza, whether your smart fridge has run out of cheese. They then get a little slice off that when the, when you know, you're know going to your smart TV and it pops up an advert for Domino's pizzas or whatever. That's, that's basically the dystopian idea of of, of how this 5G is going to work from that particular perspective. But at, at the Gateshead Council, um, and I want people to watch this, there's a YouTube video, Mark Steele at Gateshead Council, there's part one and part two. And in part one, Councillor McElroy, who is referring to the headed door symmetry, makes this statement, and it's extremely important. The headed door symmetry at PHE has stated that my assumption, Mark Steele's assumption, that microwave radiation has a more deleterious effect on small living, living things, small children, the unborn, women and children, is not borne out in science. Now, unfortunately, right, this is a very, very worrisome statement because basic physics, basic laws of physics are being broken here by the head of door summary at PHE. Now, Gateshead Council won't give me that person, even after an FOI, and that outrageously unsubstantiated statement will have refused to name that individual because I would want to find out how they could come to such a... I mean, has it come to the fact that scientists employed by the government using taxpayers' money, paying these people money, right, and they don't understand the basic... The base, the basics of physics. I mean, this is just unbelievable. So we've got a bit of an issue here. Now, I know why they said it, because I know that the international regulatory standards, and they're not standards really, they're only guidelines. Now, think about this. There's no real standards, just guidelines. These guidelines, and I've just quoted Professor Paolo Vecchio to say, do not use them as a defensive wall. They are being used by as a defensive wall. They are only guidelines and they only apply to 200 pound males. Now, the, obviously the statement that came from the headed to assembly, that's to cover because obviously in my near locality, putting these 25 milliwatt transmitters on the top of a street light, now to put that into context for the listeners, 
a one milliwatt transmitter is the maximum you can expose to a 200 pound mill. These are 25 milliwatt transmitters. They are extremely hazardous, but they attract small flying pollinators to those lights. You attract a small pollinator within a couple of meters and you will annihilate it. And that's obviously what we've seen. We've seen an annihilation event of small flying insects. And one of the reasons why everyone who is listening to this particular radio program will have realized that they aren't seeing any bees. We brought this particular issue up with the National Bee Unit. Now, this is another very, very worrisome situation. The National Bee Unit, after speaking to a few local uh, beekeepers whose bees uh, mysteriously disappeared over the rollout of these transmitters, we spoke to those beekeepers, all their bees have gone, and we brought this up with the NBU, and we asked the NBU, have you any evidence, is there anything about, because we're seeing an annihilation event for bees in our locality from these transmitters. The NBU came back and told us quite clearly that they had evidence, they had actually had research papers to show that telecommunication signals, microwave radiation signals, did not affect bees. In fact, they had evidence, they'd done research, and that was the conversation. Now, we'll have this in writing. We then thought, well, that's a bit strange because there's lots of published research to show that microwave radiation has a very, very deleterious effect and is an annihilation event for small pollinators, including bees. And I know the government will try and blame nicotinoids, and I'm not saying that nicotinoids don't have some impact. That's a smokescreen. The real killer, microwave radiation, and the increased ubiquitous use of it. So when we went back to the MBU, and asked them for their research. We were quite interested to see this research and see if it had been done in a uh, not in a very scientific way, because obviously what we wanted to do was see it, and we didn't get a re we didn't get any reply. So we then sent an FOI to the NBU, and the NBU came back and have now admitted they do not have any research. They have not carried out any research to show that these telecoms do not affect bees. Now, why would, so that's, we've got two public bodies who are populated with scientists, not scientists as far as I'm aware, because like I said, any scientist who can totally discount the thousands of papers that show these transmitters have a significant detrimental biological effect on humans, small-bodied insects and animals. If you can discount all of that, then those little bits of paper that you have on your wall to tell you you're a scientist, they're not. They're using them as blinkers. Blinkers so that they can carry on with the role that they have, hoodwinking. And one of, my, one of the biggest concerns I have, these people are reporting back to ministers. And ministers are driving the agenda with research funds and budgets in you know, autonomous cars, etc., etc., this is an absolute outrage. How can we have a country with scientists or populated these institutions, populated with individuals who either don't understand the basics of the science that they're supposed to know about or will actually misinform the general public when they ask questions at these institutions? That's what we do. We don't pay tax for that. And Great Britain is a better country than what, than what it is becoming. Well, absolutely, I agree with that, Mark, and that's what we're trying to do something about. And before we get into that audio, which I want to play, I just wanted to talk about the 5G rollout. Now, the Council of Europe, the recommendation 1863, which came out in 2009, this is very, very important that people know this. And it will become apparent why it's important as the show carries on. It stated that environmental related pathologies are not confined to respiratory and cardiovascular diseases or specific types of cancer, but include other chronic and emerging pathologies, immune system impairment, neurological and neurodegenerative illnesses and disruptions of the hormones and reproductive system. Now, it says it carries on. 
everyone should look at this paper. It states political authorities must act in order to prevent disease and health crisis. Primary prevention of environmental risks must be encouraged. Risk assessment must be based on solely scientific criteria and resist pressure exerted by political or economic lobbies. Now, that is a huge one because that's exactly what's happening. Uh, political and economic lobbyists are basically running the show. And this document says that has really got to be fought against and should not be allowed to happen. It said environmental diseases are growing in a disturbing manner. Take account of the warnings of European Environment Agency regarding electromagnetic pollution and specific health risks attributed to mobile phone systems. Implement mobile laboratories analysing homes and buildings by request of the public. Now, this is very serious because we don't see any of this getting out to the public. All this we get is the views of lobbyists and these government ministers. And it takes us back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the show. All of the people involved in government and transport in this country are zombie-like in their exposition of autonomous vehicles as though it's already here and we're already using them. Well, if you go back to what we were saying at the beginning with this massive and increasing shortage of lorry drivers to actually bring about the distribution of food and whatever else we need. The whole infrastructure of the country really still depends on the roads. Um, well, they've not taken that into consideration and they're openly saying now that it's all going to be automated. So this goes into the whole bigger picture of automation, robots, the rest of it, autonomous cars, and it takes us into 5G and we're going to get into that as the show goes on. But first of all, Tony, I'd like you to play this audio. Now, what Mark was saying about this 31,000 um, lampposts being used for this 5G rollout, it's happening in Waltham Forest. It's happening in many boroughs. I just did a, a quick search on this and loads of stuff came up. Arkiva have got a concession for this to be rolled out, this 5G rollout, in Barnet, Brent, Camden, Hammersmith and Fulham, Haringey, Harrow, Hounslow, Islington, Kingston-upon-Thames, Lambeth, Merton, Rich, Richmond-upon-Thames and Wandsworth. Arkiva also has similar deals in Manchester, Southampton, Colchester, Eastbourne and Medway. Now, we're going to talk about this fella Stephen Hilton just briefly because he's the director of Bristol Futures Global. Now, Bristol is a smart city. It's going to be one of the first smart cities. And of course, we've already got the facial recognition rollout in Glasgow. And this is now spreading very quickly. We've got smart motorways. The whole smart grid is being put into place nationally. And people don't really know what it means. But this fellow, Stephen Hilton, is in charge of Bristol Futures Global, which affects millions of people because it's a rollout all over the country. And this video on YouTube has had 21 views, maybe 22, maybe 23 now, because both me and Mark have looked at it. But this is quite shocking because there's no public engagement going on here. And that's what we talk about every week. So, Tony, can you play that audio? Yep, there we go. Well, well, um, um... With 25 different partner organisations all working together during such a short period of time, just 12 months, we need, obviously, really strong project leadership and governance. But we also, we also need to develop a way of working that allows for all of those partners to understand what each other is doing. And through that communication, we'll develop a, a sort of more agile approach that will allow different sorts of outcomes to also emerge, other than the ones that we already know about. So I'm really interested in how we create that assembly, that, that project forum that brings together the tech companies with the creatives in a, in, a, in a real way in order to look not, not just at how we deliver the outcomes for this project, but how we create the sort of conditions and the relationships that means that this will be a springboard for the future projects and the future businesses that will really make the region and the UK a, a, a pioneer and a leader in terms of... Well, that was all the usual kind of soundbite nonsense that we hear. And 
it doesn't really say anything, but it's got two other videos. One's on smart tourism and 5G visitor safety. So he's convinced that the 5G grid is going to be very useful for keeping visitors safe. And of course, this smart city operations, he's the director of Bristol Futures Global. And that is on YouTube, but nobody's seen it or heard it, apparently. Now, this is the sort of mentality, I suppose, that you're up against, Mark, because there's no engagement from these people with the public either. Well, what, what, is, what you know, when, when this story gets out, what, what's going to happen? Nobody's going to go to Bristol. I mean, Bristol University ruled out 5G, experimental 5G. Now, these experimental waveforms, make no mistake about it, you're in breach of the Nuremberg Code. You can't test them on human beings, and that's exactly what's happening. This, this, this is illegal. This is illegal. It's very, very unlawful. You cannot test technology on the general public without doing full risk analysis. These waveforms are experimental. Bristol University have had a absolute, uh, well, inexplicable number of people committing suicide. Now, Professor Martin L. Powell, who's an expert in this particular field, in the 2015 very well well published paper, very, very well cited. I cite Martin Powell all the time. Because like I said, he is the expert in the field in this particular, in microwave radiation exposure for non-thermal effects on biology. Martin has actually shown the neurological disorders. So the fact that uh, Bristol University have got some something extremely strange going on, and we know that this microwave radiation causes short-term memory loss, causes neurological disorders. It's one of the reasons why there's so many soldiers who are suffering from this post-traumatic stress disorder, where they have been exposed to battlefield interrogation. Because one of the things that we have to cover, most of this telecoms equipment is designed autonomous vehicles, LIDAR systems, radar systems, etc. They are all military-funded projects and products that are ending up in, you know, everyday areas without any care. Now, obviously, a battlefield, a battlefield somewhere where there's a significant amount of risks and obviously there's not really a, that much care taken in, in the impact of someone being blasted with a load of microwave radiation that caused some neurolo neurological damage due to the fact there's a lot of bullets running around so there's other criteria and there's other things that take precedence, which I understand. However, in a normal cityscape, we have to be very, very aware of the impact and the increasing impact from these non-thermal microwave radiation systems, signal systems. So if we touch on autonomous vehicles, I mean, autonomous vehicles, I spoke to the Department of Transport. I'm very concerned about 5G very, very concerned about autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles are a clutch of battlefield interrogation systems, LIDAR, radar, pulse modulated radar systems, phased array systems. And these systems are potentially absolutely catastrophic to human beings in biology. So it's a bit bizarre that we have government agencies. In fact, I had to laugh. Department of Transport have on their uh, on their main page about autonomous cars being safe. Autonomous cars are nothing of the sort. In fact, any part of the infrastructure that breaks down, let's say it's through encryption or someone hacks it, this could be a catastrophe. And it's a, it's the same as electric vehicles. Electric vehicles. If anyone was to know that, you know, putting a child, I would never ever put a child in electric in an electric vehicle. A child in electric vehicle, the the the, the uh, magnetic flux from the battery and the motor could potentially be a threat to that child, because all of the current regulatory, uh, let's say, guidelines, which these people use throughout all of the time do not apply to smaller bodies than 200 pounds. And obviously body density is a major factor. One P 
piece of information, that absolutely appalling piece of data that came out of the US here only recently. There's been a 38% increase in young women suffering stroke. These are 18 to 30 year olds. So, I mean, apart from the tragedy, think about the economic impact in a country. At the same time, from the same geolocation, there's been a 15% increase in young men suffering strokes. So consequently, I believe that head size is a major issue. And as anyone will know, microwave radiation has a more deleterious effect. And we can show that the IAEA did a very interesting document. And these, this is a body that PHA actually rely on, showing that their uh, misinformation that are given to local authorities, government ministers, etc., is not borne out in science where the deleterious effect from these type of radiation transmitters is significantly more impacting on smaller bodies. So there's a, there's a lot of things to talk about. Autonomous vehicles, I mean, electric vehicles, for instance, uh, in fire. We know that, um, you know, these uh, lithium-ion batteries can be an issue. In fact, if, let's say, let's have a, let's, do a little bit of a, a, a summary here. If, let's say, I had a, a road a transport, a haulage transport vehicle on, on, the, on the streets of London with a very, very large battery, and that vehicle was, for whatever reason, in an accident, there was a recent accident in the USA where a, a, an electric car is actually basically blew up. If that, was, uh, that battery had a large charge in it, which I'm sure it would do, uh, and you had an explosion, you would have a hazard materials issue. And has there been any uh, sort of assessment to see a bomb of that sort in the middle of a city, uh, how you would clear up that uh, hazardous material? Because non-ionising, sorry, um, the, uh, the, the batteries in these vehicles are extremely, extremely hazardous if they, if they are burst into flames. So not only the signal systems that they use to geolocate themselves are hazardous, the radar systems, the LIDAR systems. Uh, that's, for instance, a LIDAR, which is currently used on a number of roads in the UK, because obviously the Department of Transport think these devices are perfectly safe, LIDAR is a cross between radar and a laser pulsing light. It's used for battlefield interrogation. However, on a, on a public road, that LIDAR, the frequency of the light, you can't see it. So consequently, you have three mirrors in your vehicle, and that laser light will be picked up in those mirrors and directed at your head. The fact that you can't see them will not stop them doing harm. And even though these are a class one laser, which is the, the, the least classification, what happens when you've got five or six of these vehicles with uh, all their lasers reflecting in your mirrors that you can't see traveling down a main road? Would that require a total redesign of vehicles? Would we have to cover vehicles in? Or would the radar, the radar of the same vehicle, uh, be bounced into those mirrors and picked up as well and directed at your head. This could cause an event where someone could be stunned, actually stunned in that vehicle. That vehicle could crash. It could hit one of the autonomous vehicles and that autonomous vehicle, its systems would fail. And what's really interesting, Lloyds of London will not ensure any harm from these transmitters to humans. So how do you ensure a vehicle that's travelling on the road, which is basically a transmitter on four wheels? It's just bizarre. Are you muted, Mark? You what? I I'm so all right. I was muted, muted there. there. Lloyds of London, conversely, will actually ensure coastline areas which are allegedly being threatened with annihilation because of rising sea levels. We, we know the world's leading expert in sea levels and he comes on the show sometimes, but I was at a conference a while ago and we got it on very good authority that Lloyds of London didn't fall for this and they would actually underwrite these coastal areas. So what you're saying 
is that basically the people at the top know how dangerous this is at the very top. But in between them, we've got the useful idiots, as usual, just spouting what they've been told. And previously, Barry Trower, who's this expert on EMF and radiation, worked in military technology. We had him on the show quite a few times. He stated years ago that it would take 60 years and there would be more deaths from EMF than World War II. Now, what we're looking at is a scenario that appears to be rather worse with the rollout of 3G. But we're going to look at that in part two of the show. But for instance, just a few little things that maybe trigger things with, within people here. Because remember that at petrol stations, it says switch off your mobile phone. It's just, so basically, these are things, just basics to think about. And Russia's non-thermal radiation regulation, uh, in other words, the amount that's allowed safely for the public is a hundred thousand times less than what is allowed by law in the United States. And also fire stations in the United States are exempt from having cell towers placed on them because they are deemed not to be safe. So why are they putting them on public buildings, putting them on council blocks? And we're going to get into the shortwave radiation this the, the mobile signal the normal mobile signal is one to four gigahertz and what we have with the 5g is 24 to 90 and these are much smaller waves these are much shorter waves mark can probably explain this much better than i can but the point is that these are much shorter waves so they require many many more towers and this is why we're seeing trees being pulled down everywhere so we've got this green agenda that's telling us we need more co2 and we're stripping the country of trees now this should start to become obvious i would think to anyone who's thinking about it we've got this agenda this fake green agenda with driverless cars which are as mark was saying more polluting in their own way than diesel vehicles and then we've got the whole country being stripped of trees and we're being told that co2 is a big problem i think this could be a way to get the public awake to this mark what do you think about that so oh, without a doubt i mean uh, if, if if you look at the you know the whole electric vehicle thing electric vehicles are uh, pretty uh, contact they contaminate the environment and the reason now they contaminate the environment Obviously, my background in oil and gas. The dirtiest hydrocarbons come out the bottom of the cracking tower and use it for tarmac. It's very, very hazardous to humans. Now, you put a heavier vehicle on the road, it picks up that tarmac, but it also, it actually uses a lot more rubber and tyres. So you're using a heavier vehicle. These electric vehicles are a lot heavier. So they pick up, they put more particulate contaminants into the air from the tyres the braking system, obviously, because of the extra weight, and the tarmac, very, very toxic. And, and you know, the, 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 the issue that I have with this whole green agenda, no one looks at the, at the risks, the risk analysis. Sintef did a study on the magnetic flux, levels of radiation inside electric vehicle cabins. And what they said was, they fit within the international regulatory guidelines. But we've already worked out that the international regulatory guidelines only apply to 200 pound mills. And, and, and the head of the ICNIRP, Professor, Professor Paolo Vecchio, has already stated for people not to rely on them. So these organisations are still relying on these outdated, unscientific guidelines because those... You can't have a scientific uh, view if you don't take into consideration all the published evidence. And the published evidence states quite clearly today, non-ionising radiation is a class A cancer-causing radiation. It also shows that it causes neurological disorders, diabetes, uh, heart disease. I mean, this 5G thing can... People's hair could fall out. You know what I mean? 
this is this 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 is a dystopian idea because the people who are behind the whole drive have total have got no regard at all for current product development um, cycles or uh, current regulatory standards. None. The five G operating system doesn't have any. It, you know, I mean, it, it, it's absolutely crazy. I mean. Uh, ICNIRP and all these regulatory bodies, the PHE in particular, PHE tests one of these transmitters against uh, a, a set of criteria, and they say that that's safe. So are they really saying the 31,875 that Gateshead Council have fitted, each one having an eight-kilometre footprint, so it's got an eight-kilometre reach, that's without it being a phased array system. We're taught phased array is a whole other ball game, and I'll go on to that, uh, I think, later on about the potential for that to be uh, a, a weapon system. In fact, I, say, I, I wouldn't normally mention the fact that phased array is a weapon. However, it was recently reported in Bloomberg where the South Koreans are using the fifth generation telecoms network is what you do, you off-step the signal, you cause a, a, a beam wave, and you can steer that beam, and you can actually use it as a weapon. And they've actually been using it against wild boar in the jungle in South Korea. So you can see the scenario where we, unfortunately, in this country, don't have any real encryption. It's part of the Snoopers Charter. In fact, I think it's an offence to go to... To, to actually have a fully encrypted system. So our back door is well and truly wide open, and we've just rolled out a potential weapon system. It's most certainly an inadvertent weapon system because, believe you me, I wouldn't get like to get between any device and a beam wave because, obviously, depending on its characteristics, it could be fatal. Absolutely. And that takes us into military technology and what they're actually saying about this. They're using the word deployment, which is a military term in the first place. So it's very odd that they're deploying these things. But getting back to these autonomous vehicles and the investment into them, which is going to be overall one billion over 10 years, the Centre for Connected and Autonomous Vehicles, um, states it's 5G millimetre wave connectivity for cars. This is what they are really pushing and the technology that they're looking into. And the Advanced Propulsion Centre is to get 1 billion, which is uh, part of the 1 billion, over the next 10 years to save 50 million tonnes of CO2. The whole thing's absurd. So they're pulling all the trees down and trying to save CO2 uh, emissions. But that's the whole hypocrisy of the of the fake green agenda, which we've covered. We've never gone into the danger of these things before, but we are talking about military technology and these cell towers, even the conventional ones, each one of those what they call Gwen towers or cell towers where they have multiple um, devices attached, multiple uh, transmitters. They have each have a 300 watt power line going into each antenna. And they have multiple transmitters, which was stated years ago could be used as a directed weapon. So what Mark's saying here is not underestimating things. And what we know about the actual rollout of this is it's being done exponentially. There's been no public consultation. And we've got these people in place like Mr. Hilton from Futures Global in Bristol. And they are putting out these videos no one's looking at and they're actually considering what the visitor safety is going to be to Bristol uh, which is kind of ironic really having heard what we've just been getting into with Mark there in the first hour I think we should probably take a little break in a bit Tony and come back with some of the detail of this okay yeah it's a lot to digest it's been uh, yeah very interesting okay are you ready to go now then with a churn I think we should. We should have a bit of Ian Terry. Okay, Ian Hound Dog Terry, yeah? That's absolutely correct. Nice, bit of rock and roll. Good music. Oh, yes. Cheers. <laughs> Magic 
welcome back to Windows on the World, part two. Not sure what's happened to Mark. Maybe he's muted his mic again because he was uh, doing a bit <laughs> Tony, of research. Tony, <laughs> I did. I started doing it again. I just said, yes, that was Ian Hound Dog Terry and nobody heard. Well, that was Ian Hound Dog Terry. And I did a gig with Ian recently at the Dugdale Theatre in Enfield. And I do miss all that. I miss rock and roll. I used to love travelling around. Um, even on my own doing gigs. But these days, it seems to have gone a bit quiet on that front. They're trying to wipe out all of our fun. I call them the joy suckers because they've taken the joy out of everything. So we have to find it again. I hope people aren't finding this information too depressing because it's quite serious stuff. But really, we have got a chance to do something about it. And people like Mark are going all around the country, uh, indeed getting into people's houses on their radio, and he's even set up um, a movement, which he's going to talk about now. Are you there, Mark? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, tell us about this. Well, can we call it a political party? It's yeah, it's a political party. What actually, what actually happened? Um, I I went through the full uh, process with Gated Council. Uh, you know the complaints procedure. Obviously, they broke a number of uh, laws. They didn't do a public consultation. This was a multi-million pound large uh, project, LED street lighting in particular. There's environmental issues. So they didn't do any public consultation, no environmental impact, no health impact. I mean, absolutely nothing. And it was rolled out covertly. This 5G neural network was rolled out covertly and in secret uh, as a control management system. It's nothing of the sort. So consequently, they've got an accountancy issue there. And obviously they've spent an enormous amount of uh, uh, taxpayers' money on something that's not what it says it is. And I actually brought this up with the council, spoke at a, at a, at a local meeting, and now what's happened, Gateshead Council have shut the whole democratic process in. Not only have they shut the whole democratic process in, there are six Labour MPs in the North East who know about this, who've had complaints from residents across the borough about this, bleeding from the nose at night, neurological disorder, sore eyes, bad heads, insomnia. I mean, everybody in the area is nearly suffering from insomnia in the gated area. And everyone you talk to are feeling down, unwell, etc., etc. So the MPs know about it, and they're just keeping their heads down. But what I did, I went through gated council's complaints procedure and didn't get anywhere. They didn't find any fault with anything that they do. So I brought it up with the LGU. That's a local government ombudsman. Now, this is pretty strange. Because I thought, well, you know, we've got the law on my side. They've obviously broken quite a few of them, including European Directive, Saw House Convention, parliamentary laws, etc. And the LGU turned around and said that Gated Council are not at fault because they have somewhere in their constitution that basically says that they can do what they want. Now, I know that that's not the case. I know that the lower court at Gated Council cannot be, well, you know, their, their laws do not overcome higher court laws. That is just an absolute nonsense. So I appealed the LGU's decision, and the LGU have still come back and said they're not at fault. Now, we, on, on that, you sort of look at the whole judicial system and think, well, how, how can this be? How can you have a local authority, a couple of executives, with a load of councillors who, I mean, like I said, the 60-odd councillors in this borough, each one of them have had a letter from me outlining the risks to their constituents from this radiation. Also, the Council of Europe 1815 document stating that they should apply what's you know, called a LORA as low as reasonably achievable. That's not 32,000 transmitters on 24 hours a day, seven days a week in breach of the carbon reduction policy, emitting radiation into people's bedrooms. I mean, we have images of these transmitters. The manufacturer says they're not safe at several metres. We have images of them directly outside people's bedroom windows and homes. Because now, Mark, I wanted to bring something up here, but first of all, just tell us about uh, saversnow.org. Just tell us a bit about the website. We're going to bring it up again later in the show, but I'd like to get people to look at that now and make a note of it. 
save us, save us now. It, it's all about the rule of law. We actually have the laws of this land were built up over many, many years. And what we've ended up in a situation where these institutions just pay lip service. So you've got this, these pseudo-organisations where the, the, you, you, you're supposed to be able to engage with them. It's all front. There's no reality to it. And especially if you start to ask the hard questions, the easy questions, not a problem, they'll engage you. Once you engage where it's something extremely serious, I mean, this is a humanitarian crime. We have women in the area where they have miscarried. This microwave radiation is known to cause miscarriage in women. And not only that, it causes significant damage to the unborn fetus. So even children that are born and survive being killed in the womb, they could be born with serious neurological disorders. So this, you know, we're not, this is absolutely horrendous. And what we've found is that the system, these institutions are impervious to anything other than an internal fight. So the reason for the political party was a, a, an ex-military guy approached me, watched a few of the videos where we've seen a total collapse and flying insects, small birds. We don't have any sparrows here. It's, this is absolutely appalling, and people have noticed. And he approached me and said it may be a good idea. The best way to tackle this is to set up a political party. So they save us now. And I implore everyone who's listening to this radio program, get involved, join the newsletter, so that we can organise ourselves. Like I said, we've got five or six Labour MPs here. This story is so bad. It's so horrendous and it's a, such a difficult question for them to answer they are just ignoring it it's like jimmy savile hillsborough i mean it goes on and on and on these people aren't i mean i spoke my local mp gates at council have refused on a number of occasions to respond to freedom of information requests i've requested the name of the scientist at PHE who will remain secret i have requested the telecoms company that partner in this telecoms rollout, because here's a really interesting thing. The liability, the telecoms companies are already warning shareholders about problems facing them in relation to microwave radiation, pollution, brain tumours, etc., etc. The local authority have now taken that liability by putting them on all of the public's property across the borough. These telecoms transmitters are part of a neural 5G network that most probably, in fact, I'm, I'm, I know for a fact, it's in partnership with a big telecoms company. I want to know who that is. Gated Council have refused that FOI. I spoke to my local MP, Liz Twist. Liz Twist ignored. I, I've rang up, I've implored them to speak to Gated Council about the refusal they are obligated under parliamentary law to respond. No response. Not this is understand. a big problem, Mark, because it's the sort of stuff that we've covered for years. And it's actually what got me into this in the first place. I was part of looking at how the administrative courts were being used against the public. And we found out that they're actually going against Halsbury's laws of England. It's enshrined in the British constitutional law or basically the laws of England, which are very broad and cover, of course, administrative, civ civil law, criminal law and everything, because all of these jurisdictions cross over. But what's happened is that they're making separate jurisdictions such as quasi criminal. So people will say, I can't get put in prison for debt. Well, you can if you agree to it now, but you have to agree to it. They have to have your consent. Also, the administrative courts like the county court there's basically no recourse within the system anymore unless you go higher up to judicial review and the people at the top know this but the people in the middle and the minions on the council will go into court and actually purge themselves they don't think it's important and they think they are removed now what you were saying earlier on today was very interesting let's talk a bit about the council pension pot because that could be under threat couldn't it Almost certainly. I mean, uh, the liability, the liability is on these individuals and the local authority. The, uh, you know, the, 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 the increase in the illness across the borough, everyone you speak to, and obviously this story, you know, 
they can't bury it forever. And, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that we've caught them out early doors, I mean, God help us if another two years had went past and this potential weapon system hadn't been identified. Uh, so, you know, the, there are some significant risks to, well, the rates payers here. The rates payers don't know. They don't know what's making them ill, but make no mistake about it. So, let, just can I, sorry to interrupt you, Mark, but oh, are you saying that the 5G is already rolled out there? You are saying that, aren't you? Just to clarify that for the listeners. Yes, yes. 5G, the 5G's ruled out right across the country. There, there will be councils who haven't fitted it, uh, but I would say, by and large, we've spoken to a number of people around the country, Sheffield, they have transmitters. Telenza, they actually make a transmitter, if you look at their website, and it tells you it's actually made, it's, it's made to look like a light uh, sensor. It's actually designed to make it look like a light sensor and to stop you asking questions. These systems, the hardware, the antennas, the design of the antenna is not normal antenna design. These are 5G antenna designs. They're the hardware for 5G. 5G is not fully operational. If it was to go fully operational, believe us, it is an annihilation event. We already seen an annihilation, small flying insects and pollinators. A 25 milliwatt transmitter on the top of that light, believe you me, it will kill. I spoke to, I spoke at a conference in Europe about bugs, about the collapse in the flying insect population, and a scientist there said, we'll have to do some research. I said, well, if I was to tell you if I had a two and a half pound hammer and put your hand on that table and hit it with a two and a half pound hammer, we can basically assume what's going to happen. So without actually having to carry out some research, which I'm sure you wouldn't want to, I said, I can tell you that there's going to be some significant damage done to your hand. Now, a 25 milliwatt transmit on the top of an LED streetlight and 31,875 of them, by the way, a small flying insect flying up to that transmitter when a one milliwatt transmitter is, well, you're not allowed to expose a 200 pound male to one flying insect, small body density flying insect. It will annihilate that living biological structure. Simple. Well, absolutely. We've covered that slightly, but there's a great document as well, which I'm going to put onto the posting when it's on windows on the world so go to windows on the world there's a document called birds be birds bees birds and mankind actually and that's got some very interesting stuff in it now we've heard about this bee collapse and that has been covered and we're now being told that the bees are actually recovering now i mentioned that to you the other day but you've got some contrary evidence to that as well haven't you well it's totally contrary i mean how could they be recovering Mm -hmm. I mean, where, where's this? Is, is this coming from the National Bee Unit? The National Bee Unit told us that microwave radiation doesn't affect bees. I mean, the, 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 you know, these people are just out of control. And, and I don't know why they're out of well, control. Well, actually, Mark, I think it's because they're under control. That's what it is. Uh, they're not yeah. sort of, if they were out of control, it might be better because they might be having sort of outbursts and going, I can't take it anymore. I can't take it. I'm out of control but they're not they're <laughs> under control that's the bloody problem but the point is that tony wanted to come in here with something and i should have brought him in earlier on because we were going to have a chat and then we've got kind of into the broader picture of the 5g almost straight away but tony are you there i'm here excellent i thought you might be yeah <laughs> San Diego. yeah there's a couple of points really uh we could go right back to the beginning and talk about the driverless uh truck business for a little bit i suppose uh, there was one point there that i'd like to have made about the actual average age of our drivers is 55 and i think we've got uh, well, i'm not going to say the numbers but there's an awful lot of them retiring obviously in the next five ten years time and that, that is not being worked on as you said and you said that they was uh, putting that money into the driverless vehicles and uh, this problem's been going on for a long, long time now. I was first made aware of it about, well, just over three years ago it was. I did work it out last night. And uh, that, that it wasn't a new problem then. So why have the government and the insurance companies and the transport industry not got together to come up with a solution? Because they all know, they have meetings about it. It's been big in that business for a long time. 
So they're obviously not willing to give young men and women jobs and work work out a way to make that happen. They'd rather give the jobs to the robots again. So that's another route into a whole whole new show that we're going to do at some point about uh, uh, probably universal basic income, I believe, we was going to do at some time because I think that's part of the road as well. Because if you keep taking these jobs away from people willingly, then you must have some sort of another plan. You're either, you're either not going to have them people or you're going to have to fund them one way or another because someone's got to buy all this rubbish that they're making. So that all links links into that and it's really clear to see the timeline of that and the importance of it. It's there for anyone to see. You can do your research in five minutes on this subject and find out the facts on that. But then we move on to the law and uh, Mark was saying that it's uh, unlawful and uh, illegal as well, which is obviously two different things, and we're aware of that, and so are most of our listeners. But the highest law, in my understanding, in this country, is health and safety law. And the reason being health and safety is at the top is because it's actually common law. It's do no harm. That's what it is. And this is a a blatant and fragrant breach of health and safety and common law, what they're doing here. So I think what you've got, Tony, is you've got this kind of nanny state approach, which has got the iron fist behind it. So in other words, health and safety is used to shut down events and it's used to it's actually used to get in the way of people engaging in any public event or something they might want to put on independently. It gives the state back control. In other words, in the old days, you'd go, oh, wait a minute, there's a hole in the road. I don't want to fall down that. But now you can't have the hole in the road. You have to have someone there at all times and it has to be fenced off completely. And there have to be health and safety monitors. And the whole thing has to go into a consultation beforehand. But that that comes into just putting an event on at a small venue now. The health and safety thing's out yeah. of control. But what it's actually covering up is is what you're saying underneath it all. What we've got is we have this idea of a vibrant economy, which we haven't got. We have this idea of vibrant communities, which aren't there. We have this idea of diversity, but everything's the same. Basically, it's all a front. And what we've got is a shop window with all this stuff in it. And the public are looking at the shop window, but they're not not going into the storeroom or actually looking at anything at all because they're not given that information. And that's what we talk about a lot because it's so important that... Once you peer behind this stuff, it's like you were saying, Tony, that all of the information is there. I've done a couple of days research onto the 5G issue, which I was aware of before. But I've looked at scientific papers that are available to every person on the planet. That's the point, isn't it? That and yeah. when we talk about the law, yes, the law is there. But ignorance of the law is no excuse. Ignorance of this stuff is no excuse because everything is on a need to know basis. And it doesn't matter how high up the system you go. The higher up the system you go, every single thing is on a need to know basis. But what we what we've got in the middle, it's like the Soviet system. We have the lie that's put there and we have the elite, the elite above it. And we're taught to fight over two lies. You can see what's happening every day in the press with that. It's all distraction issues. Nothing of importance is addressed. And these MPs and people in government and people who should be our public servants are engaged in the same sort of nonsense. It's like we're saying people are actually more concerned about being abused on Twitter than radiated to death by 5G. So that is the situation. And the people at the top, at the very top, know this and they have a plan to depopulate the planet. It's all there. It's in the UN documents. The two to three billion is the aim for now. And the public go, but why would they want to do that? And this is the problem. The public do not realise that the government is not there to serve you. The government is now there for us to serve. And there's a huge difference. These are meant to be public officials. They're meant to be public servants. My interaction over the past year, even doing these shows, as you know, Tony, has been with these people on as high a level as I can get. And one thing I know for sure is that 90 percent of them are lying 90 percent of the time. 
Those are the only facts available when you look into it. And that's what I've proved with the recent court case. That's what I proved with taking down Crime Stoppers. It's what I proved about the police. Now, the thing is that they're called useful idiots and they're everywhere. So the public have to reclaim their own sovereignty. It's not going to be done at any higher level because the infrastructure has been taken out. Public service has been taken away. End of rant, Tony. Back to you. Yeah, well, it was a good rant. And I would just like to say that this is another real clear, easy road for people to see that local government and national government no longer work for you. They do not have your best interests at heart. It's clear as the writing on any wall. Absolutely correct. Now, we've talked about uh, the, the autonomous vehicles, the green agenda, the 5G rollout. And we're going to get more into the 5G over the next few weeks because... Once I've scratched the surface of something, I see the same thing. It's the bottomless pit that appears, but it's a bottomless pit of pretty much the same kind of paradigm. In other words, it doesn't matter whether it's this you're looking at, climate change or anything else. We're not being told the basics. So that's what this show's about. And Mark's gone into some very disturbing elements of this there. But all it does is reinforce what we've been saying for well, years, really, that there's no public engagement. And what we have to do is get that back. Now, the encouraging thing is that people all over the country are contacting me. When I went out last year to do those festivals, people knew about what we were doing. And there's a very sensible audience out there who can get organised. And that's what we're looking for, because loads of these movements have come and gone over the years. Oh, we've had free man on the land. We've had this. We've had that. We're going to take this down. We're going to take that down. They're all taken over. What it needs is something with a clear central aim. Now, this 5G thing, I think, is a, a clear central aim because it's a weapon that's being used against the public. But everyone wants to be engaged in it because it's great. We're all addicted to it. So they get you addicted and dependent on this technology. And then you find out, oh, there's something behind the curtain. And that's really what we're trying to do. But Mark, uh, yeah, would you like to expand on anything that you haven't talked about so far so we can throw in some more thoughts about that? Yeah, well, most certainly I would I would implore people who have money, because obviously anything like this, I always look at it because obviously businessman, I always have my... Uh, economics head on so I was you know Q Bono he who benefits and I look at this as you know 5G 5G will decimate businesses it will because obviously you're going to see a collapse in the population people who are sick aren't at work so there's an impact on the economy you have people who are suffering short-term memory loss if you extrapolate on a production line everybody's forgetting what they're doing I mean everybody you talk to uh, in our area with this 5G, all suffering short-term memory loss. That's long-term dementia and Alzheimer's. We'll have the peer-reviewed research that shows that. So that might be good in the short term for nursing home people. However, businesses will suffer. People with money will suffer. People with money may be targeted. Judges, barristers, solicitors, anyone who goes up against the system could become a target. This 5G neural network, I can 3D map your home. I have the photographs. I've got the imagery from it. I can 3D map your home, and I can actually attack you in your bed using a signal. So anyone who, let's say, in the public sector who's got a nice fat pension, they could be significant, significantly at risk. So the same people who are rolling this technology out do not understand the implications of it when it's fully operational. There's a fully operational signal. You can steer the beam. I can target you. Obviously, if you're anywhere near one of your devices, I can see you in your own home. It's basically just like a scanner. In, in phased array, radar, very sophisticated piece of equipment, but it's also a weapon, like your autonomous car. Now, think about this for a little scenario. I'm travelling down the road in my little old vehicle there and somebody comes up behind us and let's say I'm a barrister in a court case and that autonomous car can be used as a weapon against someone else travelling on the road. 
in the Department of Transport, you know, they're not. They're, they're, I don't think it's a suggestion that you're going to have one or two of these autonomous cars on the road. By the time you had 50 or 60 cars on the road or on a, in a cityscape, the toxicity levels from the radar alone, human beings would not be able to be on the road. I did a, a, an article, uh, Mark Hinchcliffe uh, published it in Motorbike Right, and we're going to get something done here in relation to the risks to motorcycles from these transmission devices. They are off the battlefield for battlefield interrogation, they cause significant neurological disorders. They could cause an event on a road where someone could get brain fog, they may not remember what they're doing. And these products are currently being tested illegally, because it is illegal, to test equipment on the general public. And as we've seen in America, one of the Uber causes just run a lady over. That's a technological test on the general public. This is absolutely deplorable. How can you bring a product to market and test it on the public and then kill one? And it's not the only one. Just last week, a Tesla car drives into the central reservation and actually explodes. So we've got a few of these accidents happening, and there's not very many of them on the road. And we have the Department of Transport who state quite clearly on their website that these are safe. These are going to save because this is the lie. This is the nonsense that is put out by the mainstream media about this is going to save lives. We're not going to see any more accidents. No, what we're going to see is annihilation and people will not be able. The toxicity levels on roads from autonomous vehicles will be such that people Human beings will not be able to drive unless you fully redesigned a vehicle where it had no mirrors, no windows. Now, I, can, I can't see anyone deciding that they want to travel to London in a can where, you know, <laughs> or a tank where they're going to be protected from this. And that's why I implore everyone, save us now. We need support, but we also need people to set up their own chapters around the country. I'm pretty sure in the northeast in particular, we've noticed all of the uh, MPs here totally got their heads in the sand, totally uh, out of, you know, they, they just won't question this local authority. It's as if they're, above, well, they obviously are above the law, and we believe there are judges, there are barristers, there are legal people. This is an environmental crime. Under the All House Convention, it's covered under, um, you know, you can, you can get legal aid for it. We cannot muster a solicitor who will act in relation to this crime against the environment. There are police officers. Police officers came to my home. I have two neighbours in my street where these masks are no a little bit closer than about uh, eight metres from their bedrooms. Fortunately for me, the closest mass to me is about 15 metres. But it, it, at that distance, I measured the radiation in one lady's bedroom. It was 1,200 millivolts. But both these ladies are bleeding from the nose at night. This is assault. Microwave radiation is a noxious substance. It's actually covered under the UK current legal system. The administration of a noxious substance is a crime. Microwave radiation most certainly is a noxious substance because the, the, the world's military use it as a weapon. So it cannot be said that it's not extremely noxious. It most certainly is. I had two police officers come to my home and they told me that they couldn't take any evidence from me. They also told me they couldn't view any of the victims in this particular crime. So I asked them on that. I said, well, who said you can't take this evidence? And they said, we can't tell you. So we've now got a secret police system where no one wants to... And I can understand from the police's perspective, it's, this is very, very complicated, not like children being sexually abused or anything like that. That's a little bit more uh, simple. However, they can't even tackle that one because it's, it's up the tree where it happened, and obviously they don't go up that tree. But it's about time that they did. And that's why I implore everybody, look, at save us now. This is a party that's been set up specifically to apply the rule of law. 
the rule of law that we already have in this country, because make no mistake about it, when the people of this country find out what's really been going on in relation to this microwave radiation rollout and the potential for it being a weapon system, believe us, they're not going to be happy. And they need a focus of a party that can actually do something for them and get this madness stopped. Well, I'm all, not to use the word autonomous, but our show used to go out on a thing called autonomous media. And what's very interesting is that over the years, lots of organisations and big ideas have come and gone. But when something has a central aim, it's usually much more successful. So restoring law and applying law is a very good premise for anything. And that is probably the best way to go with it. I just had a thought about the autonomous and electric vehicles, because if we look at how safe vehicles, ones that you drive, have been phased out, first of all, with the low emission zone, then the ultra low emission zone. And of course, all of those people who had a transit van that might have been a few years old had to get rid of it, costing them thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds to replace now they're being told that the diesel cars that they bought because they were told that they were the thing to get are now dirty and polluting. Got to get rid of those. Ultra low emission zone, Mr. Sadiq Khan. Um, more and more people are getting kicked off the road all of the time. And then they bring in these cars, which are basically death traps and very dangerous with these levels of radiation. Is it possible that they're trying to get rid of cars and vehicles altogether? Because that's what it looks like to me. Well, Tony, a lithium mine battery. I mean, if, if let's say you have an event in the middle of London, let's say Oxford Street, yeah. one yeah. of these Arctics or one of these battery cars blows up, all right? Because they can't do. In fact, if I was to hack into them and stress the battery, you could actually get them to blow up. Right. So it's not beyond the realms of a foreign agency or, uh, you know, a wannabe terrorist where they could actually take one of these uh, electrical vehicles, stress the battery, blow it up in the middle. All of a sudden you've got uh, a hazmat issue where you've got hazard, hazardous uh, toxic chemicals and they need to be cleaned up. Now, is anyone really looking at this? Uh, you know, how, how, how long would you have to... Uh, to, to sort of cordon off the whole of Oxford Street until you cleaned up this mess. I mean, this is, you know, the talk a while ago about these dirty bombs that, you know, some wannabe terrorists might want to drop in the middle of London, how, how much of a catastrophe that would be. Well, guess what? If you run one of these vehicles into the middle of London, you can basically use them as a bomb. Well, exactly. You've just made that point, and it's a very important point. But surely the high ups at the top level must know this. They must know. So I'm thinking of the agenda behind the whole thing now, because we always try and look at that. And we know that they're trying to get everyone out of cars anyway, onto public transport. But interestingly, I was looking today at a website which took me to a new organisation which I hadn't come across before which is all about the housing and infrastructure, the way things are basically pulled together for the good of the people. And it's a very interesting thing. It was called the Academy of Urbanism. And they were talking about new society, social justice. This guy, Robert Fishman, he was talking about social justice was every second word, basically. And social justice actually means no justice. It means justice for nobody. It means the state has ultimate control. And basically, they use things like political correctness and em empowering minority groups to take away your rights. That's what social justice actually means. It means the reduction of your rights. It means that no Nobody has any rights because under the UN, we all have rights as a person before the law. But as we know, when we go back to what a person is, a person is a legal entity. A legal entity can only be conveyed. It has no rights within the law. That's why you get into court and you realise, wait a minute, I've been railroaded here. Oh, I'm property. That's why. Because I was represented or because I was judged to be an imbecile. We don't need to go into that one. But what was interesting was they were given the background of places 
like Letchworth and Welling Garden City and how these were set up in the 60s as a really good idea. And in a way they were because the people behind it were innovators like Hampstead Garden Suburb. What they did is they brought in the infrastructure and they were still against cars. But what they did, they knew that they had to have busy roads. So they 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 created areas with loads of cul-de-sacs. And one thing I didn't know was that Milton Keynes was meant to be working on a figure of eight shape with um, a free tram that went all the way through it like a monorail. That was the that was the idea. And the the monorail would be paid for out of taxes, but would be free. And all of these sort of values, they were quite good in a way when you look back at what they were trying to do. But they were talking about the expected population rise. And this is where it all ties in for me, because the, the U, UN want to get things down to their global billion or global two to three billion will do to start with. And Bill Gates is openly saying that vaccines will reduce the population. That's in his TED talk. And when you look at what these people are doing, what I'm trying to get to is behind the scenes. It's probably possible that this is being done to get rid of private transport altogether, in my view. And that's just looking at the surface of it. I've got a friend who's got um, a Leaf, one of these electric cars, and he loves it. But I said, well, how far can you go? He goes, well, I can go to I can go to the edge of Kent and back, um, but I have to recharge on the way. So you can get like 90 miles or something like that at the moment. I think something along those sort of lines. And you think, well, wait a minute, I get in a camper van and I want to keep driving for five hours. I don't want to just keep stopping to charge the thing up. And so to me, the whole thing is about restriction. It's about restriction of movement. But yeah, looking back to what this urbanization was like in the 60s and 70s, some of it, when you look at it now, makes sense. Whereas what's happening now doesn't make sense at all, especially with the regeneration in London, this high density housing, which would not have even been considered in the 60s, is now the norm. And everything's around transport hubs. So they're trying to take away our rights of movement. I've talked about this a lot. You know, the parts of London now are looking like an open, open concentration camp. So once they bring in this technology, they have full spectrum dominance, in my view. I mean, we've talked about it being militarized and they talk about deployment. So we're not really far off that. And the public aren't aware that a lot of this stuff is actually a massive control grid. And they, they are getting further and further corralled into much smaller spaces and much smaller areas of their perceived freedoms and it's all being done on the back of the voluntary sector and community when in fact it's completely the opposite and what I wanted to ask you about as well Mark was um, the regeneration in your area are you seeing high density housing and flats being put around cell towers because where I used to live they had those massive cell towers we talked about the other day the ones like a big cone yeah. Right. They're building them right next to these new developments. Have you got any thoughts on that? Well, it's all it's all part of 5G. The, and the reason for the cone is because yeah. if you saw the antennas underneath, they don't look very nice. And obviously, people they don't want people to see that. These these 5G neural networks, the hardware, like I said, has already been rolled out. And once it's fully operational, these higher frequency waveforms, as you mentioned before, are absolutely lethal. That protect, I mean, totally untested. They can affect oxygen. I'm going to fix it. I mean, you could you could actually see the scenario where someone could take control of one of these neural networks. And this isn't just me saying it. The U.S. military's full battlefield wind T systems. They're now decentralising all of that comms. The U.S. military, and the reason for that is because it's been hacked. The NSC is in our sanctum was hacked. So if the U.S. military can't secure their systems, make no mistake about it, the U.K. government and GCHQ most certainly can't secure theirs because the Internet was built like a Swiss cheese full of holes. It's got back doors everywhere. It's got access points everywhere. But unfortunately, any sophisticated hacker, any wannabe terrorist or anybody who just understands the way around the Internet, the tools are already available on the Internet. Uh, in how you would actually go about hacking into these systems. So we've basically rolled out these uh, data-gathering devices 
that can be weaponized if, let's say, somebody fancied it. And we're putting them in close proximity to people's homes where they can't get away from them. And they were using public sector money. There's no security. I mean, the, the disgrace that's going on in Sheffield uh, with the rollout of these, uh, with these, uh, these, these five G, and the masquerade, the local authority, and that little junket that they've had with uh, with our telecoms uh, construction company, Amy, and chopping down all the trees. You know, I've actually, I've actually looked at a document that was done from Surrey University on a total removal, 100% removal of all trees so that 5G networks can get 100% uh, active across the country. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but 5G signals, higher frequency signals have a problem with foliage in trees, and especially if it's wet, it takes the signal to earth. So you've got a problem with attenuation in the wet. You've got a problem with trees in the wet. So guess what? All your trees are coming down. The trees were planted by the Victorians, obviously, to, uh, to, to, to help the environment, city environments in particular, because they wash out a lot of the toxins. They pump out a lot of oxygen. They're taking a lot of carbon dioxide. There are hundreds of thousands of trees. The, it's proposal to take them down. And I think it was... 17,000 trees in the centre of Sheffield. Are we going to lay our city's bare of trees so that someone can roll out a class of cancer causing radiation transmitter outside of your bedroom so that your local authority can do a bit of data gathering and sell your data illegally and covertly to the highest bidder? I mean, this, this is a is very important point, that Mark, because years ago there was a Vodafone application for a block that was going to be outside this block of flats, this proposed block of flats. And it was turned down through public engagement. Three months later, it was there. I got onto my local MP. Oh, well, she's more interested in that she might have been insulted on Twitter. And she said, oh, it's nothing I can do anything about. Well, I was thinking, well, what are you actually there for? And this is the problem because there has been no public engagement. But what I saw was these towers are being put right next to these buildings. They're not like 10 feet away. They're next to them. So there's, there's something that I put together years ago. And I talked to Deborah Tavares in California about that. And she was saying that there is a different agenda because the other thing is as well, what we're finding is that where there's loads of cell towers, the phone signal doesn't get any better. Have you got any thoughts on that? No, no, well, well it won't. Uh, in, like I said, in 5G, 5G's got absolutely nothing to do with your phone. Your, 5, yeah. your 5G signal's basically about data gathering and, and 3D mapping your home. And, you know, to go back to, you know, it's like the smart meter fiasco, total and absolute fiasco, it increases the risk of fire, increases the risk of uh, ill health, cancer, etc. Basically, so somebody can actually spy. And it's already been identified. Toby Warren did an article in the Mail Online and GCHQ have actually made a statement saying that this could, have, this could be a catastrophic issue because our critical energy infrastructure could be hacked into through these smart meters. So GCHQ are saying that the encryption system is an issue. The head of military intelligence is saying it's an issue. The minister for the Ministry of Defence is saying it's an issue. And we're still rolling it out. This, just, this is just absolute madness. It shows the ineffectual ability of people in positions of power to stop this bus. I mean, it's unbelievable. We're seeing brain tumours are now the most frequent form of cancer in adolescence in the USA, we see mental health issues, mental health costs to the UK alone last year, £99 billion. That's not taken into consideration the £10 billion for Crohn's, etc. Diabetes, heart disease, cancers in children. You know, I mean, no one's taken into consideration. This is absolutely horrendous. And this is 3, 4G 
not 5G. 5G basically means more. It means more of everything. It means billions of these antennas, closer proximity, higher frequency, larger part of the spectrum. So it's more of what's already made us ill, seriously ill, and it's collapsing the economy or the, then the country's economic viability is all being affected by this. And what we hear from politicians and the mainstream media is the exact opposite. We've got to roll 5G out. I'll tell you how bad 5G is. I spoke at Northumbria University uh, two weeks ago on a Thursday night. And the government, we, we had a, a 5G expert there who's been supported by the Northeast LEP. Uh, and he was going to talk about the benefits of 5G. There was an encryption guy going to talk about encryption. And there was myself. And I was going to talk about the risks to and from 5G. The guy, didn't, the guy didn't turn up. And I was told yeah. by the guy who set up the case, he'd been warned off by central government, do not engage me. And the reason for it, this is a humanitarian crime. 5G is an existential threat to the economy, the environment, and humanity. This is serious. It's happening now. That's why I tell everybody who listens to this radio program, I'm not making this up. I implore people, do your own research. If you think I'm a conspiracy nut, do your own research. Martin L. Parr, Professor Devra Davis, Oli Johansson, these serious scientists, Right, who basically had their work cut, shut, shut in, Ollie Johansson's work, fantastic scientist. These, these people have, have, have put their uh, risks, their, um, their, their, their livelihoods, their reputations to bring this to the public's attention. It is up to us now to act. And the reason for the Save Us Now is it's a vehicle for people who, the fracking, HS2, all these disparate groups to come together to stop this madness. We are being railroaded. I mean, HS2, for instance, it's 35-year-old technology we're buying from Japan. They're using the Chinese and the Japanese are using monorail. Monorail was actually invented in the Northeast. So we've actually exported our innovation, and the Japanese and the Chinese are using it, and we're buying their 35-year-old Electric trains technology. I yeah, mean, it's insane, the whole thing. We've got another clip to play, actually, Mark. I think it's quite an important one because it goes along with what you were saying a couple of minutes ago. And it's about these anomalous towers that have been put into Manhattan and they've got lights on. They do look like something out of a dystopian science fiction film, it has to be said. But could you just play that clip, Tony, and then we'll get into chat. Probably not just a decoration. It's a bit mind-boggling that the MTA is approving $100 million for what appears to us to be uh, big decorative uh, pylons. John Caney is leader of the watchdog group Reinvent Albany. What we're asking for is transparency from the MTA. We demanded answers from MTA chairman Joe Loda. Some of your own board members say they don't know the specifics. The base of these new um, uh, new pieces that are going up uh, include whatever uh, fiber optics are necessary for those homeland security items. In other words, anti-terror technology. Could it one day include facial recognition? We don't know. He won't say. I'm not at liberty to discuss that. So watch as more of these expensive towers rise with mystery tucked away inside them. In Lower Manhattan, Dave Carlin, CBS 2 News. So that's very indicative of what's going on and what we've been talking about. There's no public engagement and there's a lot of secrecy, especially with those towers in Lower Manhattan, which do look like, as I said, something out of a dystopian science fiction movie. They have these lanterns strapped to them that look like searchlights, which are probably infrared. But obviously, we're not being told and you couldn't really tell from the footage that I saw. But you can find that on YouTube. But let's get into a bit of the chat, Tony. What's happening? Oh, we've got uh, lots going on. It's been extremely busy in the chat tonight. A lot of interest in this subject. And uh, let me just pull my document over there. What have we got? We've got... Right, Eric said microwave ovens were banned in the former Soviet Union. 
I'm old enough to remember when the American embassy in Moscow was targeted with microwaves. Staff in the embassy went down with a range of illnesses. Many later died. It happened in the late 1970s. Eric also went on to say, the fl- flamidamide drug was perfectly safe when it was marketed! Exclamation mark. Midrin says, yes, Eric, nowadays it's used as a cancer treatment alongside rocket fuel byproducts that chemotherapy medicines are made from. Don't get cancer. Yeah, good advice, but there are remedies out there that can heal your body in those circumstances. Midrin also says, ah, oh, don't worry about bees. I think Monsanto have that covered for us. Yeah, I've heard some interesting stories about what they're doing with bees. I've also heard about nano bees and micro bees and all this sort of thing as well. Very interesting. Right, uh, spot on, my friend, says Eric. The NHS was formed to enable the nuclear industry to continue to make a profit. Hence, cancer treatments were our spin-off from that industry. Right, uh, Eric says... Many well-meaning politicians started the NHS but don't realise hundreds of years of cheap, well-proven natural medicine was simply destroyed in 1948 when the NHS was formed in favour of unproven modern medicine. And we will be doing something about this very soon. There are uh, some very good new things coming out and people need to learn about that. We're going to get on that. Uh, Who's this? This is Tartary. 5G doesn't cause cancer to robots and other silicon-based life forms. Yes. Hey, that's a really good point. I think that's just summed up the whole show. We're not needed anymore. Mm-hmm. Great. <laughs> the leisure economy's here. We're all going to be volunteer. Wait a minute. I've heard that somewhere before, haven't I? The local council. Yes, the voluntary sector. That's the biggest rise as far as they're concerned. They want a whole front of voluntary people living in poverty who are going to be radiated. Never thought of that before. Actually, I did. We've talked about it nearly every week, haven't we? <laughs> we have, yeah. <laughs> Eric says, 5G, what a marvellous way of bringing about the 80% depopulation plan. It's more efficient than bullets. I wonder if 5G affects underground bases. Hmm. Tartary says, the Chinese government uses microwaves for crowd dispersal. When the cops... Yes. That's absolutely true. And I was looking at the military technology for that. And that's absolutely what they do. But they actually use the system which heats the surface of the skin, which is exactly the same power system as they're using in 5G. In other words, they're using the millimeter wave to do that. I was looking at the military active denial system. Basically, they just they shoot um, a concentrated beam through a lens at a crowd of people and their skin starts burning and they run away. So, yes, we've been talking about so-called non-ionizing radiation, but we now know that really that none of this is safe. None of it's been tested. And in summary, I think that the idea that the population can do something about it is probably quite important as it's being rolled out as we speak. And this plan has obviously been put into place quite some time ago. Indeed. And I think we probably could come up with some sort of a document that people could uh, kind of take notes from or bits from and send to their local councils, MPs, whatever. And I think it should all be based around health and safety and the do no harm business and uh, the fact that there's no, uh, uh, what is it? What's that thing that you have to do? Uh, uh, Risk assessment. Risk assessment. That's right. Right, uh, our ex-surveillance uh, officer friend has sent us this one. When the cops put a tracker on a vehicle, it forms part of a system that runs alongside our motorway network from aerials that look like candlesticks. That is called S-M-A-R-T. Hmm. Ben, yes. Ben's in the chat. Hiya, Ben. Good to see you back. Uh, I've been trying to wake my family up to the dangers of Wi-Fi and 5G smart meters and so on for over a year. And they are still more interested in things like The Only Way is Essex, Facebook, etc. Yeah, we all know that one, Ben. Babushka says, 5G, is this why the birds, whales, fishes are committing suicide? Stu says, the more I hear about these pesky Russians the more I want to live there. 
Well, that's part of the plan, really. That's part of the trap. They're all in it together, as far as I'm concerned. There is no them and us. It's just all a pantomime, but that's another show. Gremlin says, 5G kills us, not the fishes. Uh, what kills the fishes is Fukushima and natural pollution like plastics yeah well i think there might be more to that and we might be getting into that with peers next next week as well so, yeah there's quite a lot to that and that's a yeah. really interesting one yeah the actual story of the oceans is very important yeah maybe that's the answer tony water world yeah remember that mm. Mm. i think they've thought of that already though yeah, Stu says, what do the fire brigade think of massive blazing batteries? Uh, I think he's talking about these things on top of lamp lamp posts. And uh, Tartary says, maybe the actual tinfoil hat would amplify the effects of 5G. Yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's an irony for the tinfoil hatters, yeah. Uh, Eric's saying, governments don't work for us. They never have done... They never will do whilst they are puppets for the banksters. 100% agreed. I think everyone here knows that. Right, Eric says, Around where I live, a few standard street lamps that were perfectly okay have been replaced with awful dull LED lamps. I wonder if those lamps carry 5G. And Anon3167 says, It's happening here in Lancashire. The infrastructure is being added to the street lighting system. And that's us up to date. There is more in the chat, but I haven't got them over yet. So, but we're nearly done. Well, that's tonight. great that we're getting people from up and down the country commenting. Mark, of course, is in Gateshead. Um, but what we're seeing is a uniformity of rollout. So that in itself tells us that our local council are not engaging with us. And that's what I've been banging on about for years, because when all this stuff was rolled out in my local borough, the regeneration plans, as they laughingly call them, then it was clear after several weeks that no public consultation had been made to close all the roads down and there was no planning going into it. Now, of course, the planning regulations have all been, well, they could say, they like to say they've been relaxed in favour of regeneration. But basically, we know that that all the council property in London was classed as brownfield, dirty industrial wasteland. So those people are all disappearing. What I find um, remarkable about this, though, is that we're in an economy that doesn't seem to be an economy anymore. I can't work out how anything works because my old bank in Waltham Forest in Ho Street, the cooperative bank, closed down six months ago. Some yuppie shop has opened up called Bank, but it's not a bank. But they say, oh, well, we're going to challenge the the current economic system by opening up a shop. We are in the post-truth world. Let's give Mark the last word. And again, just tell us where we can find the website again, Mark. The website, it's uh, it's www.saveusnow.org.uk. So it's save us now, all one word. All we're looking for is people to set up their own chapters. Uh, obviously, the things only it's very embryonic. We've just been given the uh, the the party, the sort of the official stamp from the electoral commission. They have messed us around quite a while, so quite a bit. To so it, it, we should have been a couple of months earlier, but there's been a lot of to and in front Where and I and I believe that's very positive because obviously they see what we're trying to do as a threat to threat the system. The Electoral Commission are not helpful at all. My friend was going to set up a political party and he kept it going for a while, but they were giving him a tremendously hard time, so that's not unusual. Tony, but, yeah. Tony, just one quick thing which I, everyone needs to understand. This energy that they're pouring out from these transmitters can change the air particulates. You can ionise them, all right? So they charge the air. Transmitters on these lights in gates at 25 milliwatts, they mm-hmm. have a 370 uh, electron volts. You only need 34 electron volts to charge an air particle. You breathe that air particle in, it has a deleterious effect on your lungs. It causes oxidative stress. Oxidative stress leads to cancer, not in all cases, but in a lot of cases. And people have to understand this ubiquitous rollout of these transmitters will kill you. It will kill your children. It will kill your pets. Children born a day and exposed to this type of radiation do not have a great prognosis. We have to get this stopped. We have to get it stopped now. Fortunately, 
in the gated area, I know quite a lot about this particular issue and this particular weapon system. And that's the reason why I went public to get it stopped. We don't stop it. I mean, I spoke to a lady the other day and she said, our husbands are terrified. He doesn't want to listen to any of the videos that I've put. I think this is the problem, Mark. We're actually out of time here, but that's a great place to leave it because you've just hit the nail on the head. Uh, The public have to pull their heads out of the sand and get away from their television sets and start thinking for themselves. And fortunately, there's a few who can. So that's great. Thanks for the information, Mark. Hope people didn't find it too disturbing, but we can do something about it. And remember to switch off your Wi-Fi tonight. That's it, Tony. Back to you. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mark and Mark. It's been a brilliant show. Excellent information. And I do hope we can do a follow-up to this soon. And thanks, everyone, in the chat. Brilliant contributions. We have got a really good chat room building up in there. And thanks again. See you next week. Have a great week.